Hi, welcome back for another episode of our entrepreneur interview series. And today we're talking to Jan Cavell. She's actually going to be sharing a couple tips for you. One about how to nail your differentiation in your business and one about how to build not just an audience, but a following of fans. And I always love, I had read the book Raving Fans at one point long ago. And so I'm always interested to hear more about that. Jan is an entrepreneur from the UK who has a few decades of running micro and small businesses behind her, including one when she was a single mother, which she built into a multi-million dollar business. Jan now writes full-time and her book on scaling a business from one to 10 million is titled Scale for Success. It's now out in the UK, the US, and Australia, published by Bloomsbury. So Jan, thank you so much for joining us, and I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. Daisy, I'm very excited to be here and really thrilled to hopefully contribute some useful information to your audience. I've been looking forward to it. I'm sure you have a lot of good info to share. And I'm looking forward just to this time of listening to your accent because those of us, you know, in the US, we kind of tend to like those British accents. So it's all good. My ears are going to be happy. <laughs> oh, bless you. Well, mine's sort of circa 1950s, but uh, you know, I can't, I can't help it. It's the voice that came to me at birth. So there we are, old fashioned. So I want you to share a bit about some of your past businesses that you've built, and we're going to take tangents off of that and learn more for our audience. Well, let me tell you very briefly about my main business, which was the one you were talking about, which I built from a single mom upwards, because that one, uh, I started off in pure desperation because we were completely penniless. And I started off with from a selling and marketing on going back to what fairly little business experience I had, let's be honest, um, which was telephone sales and used a very tight, tatty leaflet, phone numbers on the phone, hammering through. It was all business to business sales. In honesty, it was just to make a living. And I never expected it to take off in the way it did. But I found that uh, I got the marketing right, uh, I suspect, probably by luck as well as design when I started. But, you know, you learn as you go along. And, and you know, that's, a, that's an extra tip I'd say to any of you listening out there. You know, you will never stop learning as an entrepreneur. It's a journey to learn from in and, you know, you're constantly changing and developing. And that's half fun. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, I did it literally from... Uh, a B2B telephone sales marketing jam from the start and built manufacturing businesses to service that platform in the end, which was not something I said I'd do. So, so yeah, I I had a lot of very, what, what you'd say was old fashioned marketing there, if you like. Uh, perhaps, of course, in B2B, you still need to have that sales relationship much more, I think, than with BTC. But part of my journey has been developing through um, the decades, let's be honest, and finding out more about how marketing is changing, how the digital world set in, which was late in my career of having a business, adapting to that. You know, we, we had clients who were going on the same journey who you know, still had um, but like their brochures. So actually we were doubling up on marketing costs for a long while because we had to have glossy websites all of a sudden, whatever they were, we were just finding out. And at the same time, we had to have old fashioned brochures because it depended on which client we were servicing. Um, I was servicing them there for, which would have been interesting. But yeah, I mean, it, it was all about whatever the client wanted, we had to get the message across. So, uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was a marketing experience over 20 odd years from start to finish. I really like the one point you brought up about an entrepreneur, you always have to constantly be learning. And that is so true because the point that you stop mm -hmm. learning about your industry, your audience, marketing, and <laughs> the new flashy pieces mm -hmm. of marketing, you kind of just stall and it negatively impacts your business. So that's one great tip right there that we weren't <laughs> even expecting. 
but I also understand because my marketing started with the more traditional media. Ah, print, right. You too. Print, um, television, radio, magazine, newspaper, yeah. outdoor billboard, some of the more traditional pieces. And then, of course, since this is my career through the years, I had to learn the new pieces of marketing that come along. And <laughs> primarily, we focus on digital now. For one thing, it's easier. It's easier mm. to reach the correct audience. But the people who also use some of those tried and true techniques find better overall results as well. So there's a reason that those ways of marketing are still around and it's because they still work. And some of them can at times when you're choosing the right marketing strategy for the right result that you're going for actually work better. Yeah. Like you, I had the more traditional pieces as the, the base of what I've grown and experienced since then. I think you're absolutely right because, um, you know, it- there's a great thing. It's, it's a bit like it. When you do your accounts, if you've done the old fashioned ledger, you actually understand how things work. If you simply put in figures into your accounting um, software, you know, you, you're not going to see the mistake as easily. And we all know that measuring with marketing is so, so important. A, a good old fashioned spreadsheet, again, before digital, you know, you found out things as to why it was important. You know, it's all very well with fancy software. It makes it much easier. But I think the why comes out of those old-fashioned things a lot easier as to why you need to do these things. I completely agree. And obviously, everything digital makes everything easier. You have backups to it. You can run complicated for a spreadsheet, you know, complicated formulas without having to do it manually. But what people often miss is that when things were done by hand, if you had to do your account ledger by hand, the time it took was also you were processing the data yourself and the relationships between it. And a big piece that a lot of people miss in all different areas of their business, especially marketing, since that's what I primarily talk about, you may do marketing on social media. You may do email marketing, website, whatever. All of the good data is there and being collected. But an easy place for entrepreneurs to skip is analyzing the data. You just kind of put it out there. You you put it into whatever system is taking care of it. But you're never scheduling time with yourself to sit down and do that analyzing piece that you would have automatically if you were doing it manually. So I think that's a very important takeaway for business owners to realize is it's not enough just to push the message out, even if it's effective. If you're getting good results, you could probably get better results more efficiently, less time, less money. If you took 15 minutes, 30 minutes a month, any amount of time and actually sat back and analyzed the data that's being collected about whatever you're doing in your business. So that that's a good point as well that I think is a great takeaway for our audience. Like you've already shared a couple of tips that weren't even on our plan, which is great. <laughs> good. But no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, as you know, I interview entrepreneurs to write about them and it's a message I'm very much hearing that during COVID, you know, entrepreneurs are going, oh, but you know, I've actually had the time to look at these figures and now I find out that my business would do twice as well if I did this. You know, and they do that. I mean, we're all so busy, but that's the sort of work we leave and think it can be put on the back burner and done next month. And that analysis, as you say, is just business changing. Very much so. And having that kind of slow down, Mm. quiet time is great for so many things, not just being able to stop and analyze, which you need to do regularly, but also for me being in a creative field, I can't be as creative when it's busy and noisy and emails are dinging and my phone's ringing and, you know, everything's going on. You kind of need that time to reflect for your business. It keeps you from going a little bit crazy too. You know? <laughs> I couldn't be more busy, yeah. So we often talk about how your business has grown, but in your case, 
you've shifted. Now you're an author. So can you tell me a little bit about the process of going from an entrepreneur of highly successful business and switching into being an author? I can. I mean, really, I, I was in a business for too long, I think. Uh, I, you know, I think it's quite easy to assume you're going to stay in a business forever and not realize that the world's changed and maybe you've changed and various other things. But I got to the stage where I was aiming to scale this thing because it made sense and it was a good business. And so obviously you should grow it. And that's what everybody told you to do. But it meant I was sort of bashing my head against the scaling wall for the last few years, well, the last 10 years, really. And it was it made life very hard. And it took me a long time to realize so some of the things that make it hard for people to, to scale. And I was also by that time a member of a high growth club in London. And like, you know, the more I talked to other entrepreneurs, the more I discovered that they too found the sort of big leap from startup to fast growth a very hard one that often goes wrong. And so Initially, my thought was to retire, and we know how long that lasts with an entrepreneur, about two seconds. <laughs> so <true. laughs> yeah, silly me. But, but, you know, I had been writing articles for a digital publication, and I went back to doing that, and then I thought, what have I always dreamed of doing, writing a book? And, and I thought, yeah, I can't write a book, what do I know about? And it, it, I kept on coming back to this curious thing about you know why is it so hard to scale and I thought I can do some research on it and talk to more people because you know I haven't seen a book on this that really discusses this question as, as so and so so that's what I started to do and and then halfway through I thought oh I'd better talk to a publisher spoke to Bloomsbury who said yes please it sounds so much easier than I know it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> But, I, you know, I'd had a couple of false attempts of writing books in the past, and I think that was probably the hard bit, you know, when you spend a lot of hours on something, and uh, on one I did get some feedback, and, I mean, you know, I thought it was all right, but, uh, and he was so right, it's part of a learning curve, isn't it? but it's hard to take as creative, as you'll know. It's interesting, quite a few entrepreneurs I talked to, even I, I have a book in my head but getting to the point of actually getting it out. I mean, it's time intensive. I also like that you didn't get perfect feedback the first time and, and you went back and did it again. <laughs> Another comment you made, and I actually did a podcast episode on this very topic a while back, was that we kind of always assume, you know, a job, a business, whatever it is, a career will last forever. And at some point you mentioned as you're trying to scale, it's like you're beating your head against a wall and the wall's not moving. And you have to decide, is it that I just need to do it a different way? Or is it that maybe it's not the right time? Maybe it's not scalable at all. I've talked to a few entrepreneurs, especially right during the initial phases of COVID. They were questioning, they weren't ready to grow their business at that point. And they were questioning, do I really have to grow? Do I have yeah. to try to get more clients, try to make more money? You know, I'm kind of content where I am right now. And they'd run into some of the, you know, coaches that would give them a really hard time for making that choice that was right for them and right for their business at that time that I don't want to grow. And is it okay if I don't want to grow? And I think I that's one of the things where entrepreneurs can get lost, we're each on our own journey and you don't have to do it just because somebody else says so. A hundred percent with you, Vicky. Couldn't agree more. It's something I've been known to make a point of as well when talking to people because, you know, I think it's, it's criminally irresponsible to tell people that, you know, it's, growth is good. You know, growth isn't good for everybody. It's not good for every business and it's not good for every person. You know, you do what's right for you. 100% with you, Vicky. Yeah, even I had experienced it when I was first starting this business. I had come off of a corporate job where I had been working about 80 hours a week for three years. You can't sustain that 
Um, like I said, we we already talked about how you kind of need some of that downtime. I made the choice that I wasn't even going to be able to work 40, which is, you know, traditional work week for a while. One of the coaches I had talked to, because we all need other coaches, even if they, all they're doing, this one was, had nothing to do with marketing, but it's someone to help you with the accountability piece. And when I was speaking to her, she, you know, vocally was against what well, can't believe you, you know, you, you don't want to grow. And I'm like, no, for me, it's right at this time. And if you don't understand that, you're probably not the right coach for me, which is okay. You're the right coach mm. for plenty of other people, but yeah. we're not all cookie cutter and we all can't try to force ourselves into that one. Good mold. for you. Good for you. So pleased you did that. So what do you wish someone had told you about being an entrepreneur? And we can go into to also being an author <laughs> before you started. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, uh, as an entrepreneur, it sort of ties in a little bit with what we were just saying, because I, I wish somebody had told me or got through to me, which maybe they did try, but we, we don't think that we will ever fall out of love of our businesses. You know, we're so passionate about when we start, you know, for our life. And, you know, I mean, I would often be found announcing, oh, you'll have to drag me out of here, you know, you'll find me here, you know, sitting in my chair over there when I'm gone, you know. And I was convinced it was for life, absolutely convinced. And, you know, actually, the world, the market, um, my reason for doing it, Lots and lots of things changed. If truth were known, I didn't love it anymore, you know, but I thought it was the right thing to do. People told me it was the right thing to do. Again, that one, you know, doing what other people say to you, do not listen, go on your own path, do what's right for you. But, you know, it, it's, it's tough, you know, and I, I think people ought to realise that what's right for them now might not be right in five years' time. 10 years time. So they ought to have a B plan as to how they're going to get out of it, how they're going to exit it, how they're going to walk away, you know, or whatever. I think that's really important. Such a great point there is to have an exit plan or also have a succession plan. Mm. If you have more than one person in your business, if you have partners or if you have, especially family businesses, having a succession plan and talking it through and thinking about it. I also, though, see entrepreneurs that it's past time to let the business go or maybe change it drastically. Yeah. And I think it's because it's our baby. You know, we've put so much into it. It's like birthing a child and watching the child grow. Absolutely. And I think we need to shift our thinking a bit on that because 99% of the time, our children grow and then they move out. Yeah. They become adults. They Absolutely. then get their own life. Some of them still at home, you know? <laughs> but we don't question that we're going to move on and our life is going to look different when we have adult kids than when we you know, had small children. And it's just an understood part of the process. Yet mm -hmm. with our businesses, we think, well, I've put so much time and work and effort and money and everything into this. I can't possibly let it go if it's not feeling quite right anymore. And yeah. you can, because that's part of growth. Life. I absolutely agree. And oddly enough, the succession plan thing is what happened to me because I thought my children would take it over. And they, of course, were being a single mum, but why? But I started it, et cetera, et cetera. And by that time, you know, 15 years on, they were more of an age to come in and but in fairness my son tried and he, he was there for five years but it made him absolutely miserable it wasn't what he wanted to do with his life you know and and in fairness it was me that said uh -uh, you go 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 and have your own life in the end but you know it, it that succession plan shouldn't be guaranteed either they might not want to <laughs> Yeah, I've always known my kids have no interest in what I do, it, but it's interesting because I've done it so long while they were growing up that they know a lot about it just by, yeah. you know, me talking about it and doing it, but none of them are interested in taking on my business. So I already know there will be 
some future plan. I may continue doing a lot of this well into after I retire, <laughs> you know, it won't be a real <laughs> retirement, but I also know that, you know, maybe not, maybe I'll just, I paint. So maybe I'll mm. just paint or maybe I'll do something else. So it's a little bit different since I know there won't be Boy, someone dude. wanting to take this over unless I bring yeah. in an outside partner, but I also don't feel guilt about it because I, I want new, different, exciting things that excite me at that point in the future. Yeah. And it may not be this in 10, 15 years. We never know. No, you don't. That's that's the thing. Um, you know, or, or, or the whole business might have changed so much in 10, 15 years or whatever. I mean, none of us know. Well, in a minute, I'm going to have you share your two special tips that you're going to share. But before that, I want you to have a chance to talk a little bit more about your new book. So tell me about that. Well, as I say, it came out of, of those struggles. And you know, it's, it's got this tag on it that um, it's to scale between one to 10 million, which is, is the publisher's description. I think in actual fact, it's very readable for any entrepreneur and a lot of the stories and uh, information in there is applicable from start up on, um, you know, it's a marketing thing, curiously enough, that they wanted to target a specific figure. But, you know, it, it there's, there's a lot of, hugely useful information in there and I can say that because of course I did have some amazing contributors to the book who are entrepreneurs across the globe so I can say how brilliant they are and that brilliance is in the book without being anything to do with me so yeah it's, it's full of advice full it's got quite a lot of marketing in and uh, obviously um, but it, it talks about sales it talks about funding marketing how to build a team up and all the other relevant bits and pieces that you would expect. What is your favorite tip in the book that has to do specifically with scaling? Because scaling the business, there's a lot of growth pains that an entrepreneur may not be realizing that they're going to be experiencing. So what would be your favorite tip around that scaling piece specifically? I think one of the things that opened my eyes the most, looking back to my own business and the various things I got right and plenty I'd got wrong, was the advice that you actually take time to plan your scale a long time in advance. Because a lot of us do what I did, which is uh, drift into just growing and growing and growing without a very calm, very ordered plan. And if you're going to scale successfully, you really want to map it out and you want to get your milestones clear on where you want to be when, on what that's going to look like, how much money you're going to need, what people are you going to need. So that it's all very gradual, but it's all planned a good sort of maybe two years in advance of each milestone where don't just drift and get bigger because you'll end up sitting on a long tidy block, block of chaos, firefighting and probably not making any money. Wonderful tip. Similar to what we do here is a lot focused around strategy, but whenever I'm working with a new client, no matter what service they're needing, social media marketing, website design, search engine optimization, it doesn't matter because one of the main pieces we do is we don't talk about just what they need right now. Mm. You know, oh, okay, I, I don't have a website. I need a website. Okay, great. You know, we, we know the basics that need to be there for you to have a website. A lot of what we talk about is where their vision is of where they plan to go in the short-term future, maybe over the next five years, yeah. because the strategy we develop for them needs to work now, but also needs to work later. That may be adding some pieces onto it. But one of the biggest problems we see entrepreneurs come with us that they've experienced is that over time, they've had different marketing strategies added on and none of them have been with forethought of how they work together and how yeah. they grow together. And so one of the most important pieces we do is have that discussion of, okay, I'm going to make you a website, fine. But if you tell me in two years time, you want to add team members to your team 
and you're going to need to be able to showcase each of them on your website, there's some pieces I can build into your website now mm -hmm. so that you don't have to redo it in two years to add that capability. And having that planned where everything you do now is able to layer the next pieces on top of it saves so much inefficiency of time, resources, not having to use 20 different programs when one could work. And it's a very important part of the strategy that because of clients that come to me and have worked with other marketers and maybe each of those worked in their own little silo, a lot of that piece is missing and we help bring that piece together. So it's very important in all phases of your business to think about two years, five years down the line, where do I want to be and what do I need to put in place today to help make that happen? That's such brilliant client care you, you gave Vicky there because I don't think, looking back on it, I was thinking while you were talking, I don't think any web designer has ever said to me, where do you want to be in two or five years' time? You know, other people might have done, coaches might have done, but not, you know, not for something like web design. You know, you really are taking extraordinarily good care of your customers there. Well, thank you. Impressed. Wow. Also with, you know, social media, email marketing, all of those yeah. pieces have that same conversation should be happening. Mm. So you have a couple of really great tips for our audience. So please share. I can't wait to hear what you say because I'm interested in both of these topics. Okay. Okay. Well, the first one is talking about market differential. And I think, you know, we have to start off with uh, a lot of people start from a point of view that they've got this wonderful product, they've wonderful service, which, and it, they're so convinced it's wonderful, but they think if they can push it on people, people are gonna find out how wonderful it is. And they cannot understand that that doesn't work in business. You know, you are talking about what people want, not what you want them to want. And so, you know, I think that's, the first thing is you've got to look for a customer's pain point, as they say, which a lot of people will have already heard of. And they come up with a lot of white noise about, you know, oh, well, I can look after you differently. Oh, I know, understand your pain points. Uh, but it is, it's just noise. And that also doesn't work either, <laughs> you know. So you're talking about um, nailing a real differential. Now, one, one thing people will go for is price. Oh, well, I'm cheaper than my competitors. But to be honest, that never works either. As you know, I mean, I can see you nodding, but maybe one or two people out there might not know. You know, if you would you really buy something because it's 5% cheaper, but you love the other product? No. You know, it, if, if it's 50% cheaper, possibly it might sway you. But you really want to sell stuff 50% cheaper than your, uh, your competitors. You know, there are one or two stores that buy vast quantities of surplus goods and market them off for a dime, shall we say, or whatever. But, you know, for the average business, it doesn't work. <clears throat> so you're looking at coming up with a marketing message that tunes into that customer's pain point. And the only way you can do that is through knowing your customer and being authentic. Those two together are what are going to do it. And one way to do it is to always go back because people get lost, but like we were talking about, people get lost the longer they stay in business. And so sometimes one way of doing it is to go back and remember, go into a bit of a daydream for a couple of hours and remember why you started out. Because that takes you right back to the authentic reason that you wanted to make a difference for your clients, that you wanted to be in this business and gets back to the authentic you, which people will relate to. And, you know, so I think that's really important. And the other is to, a part of this is to talk to your clients, which again, everybody says, but there's, there's two ways of doing it. And, and I think it's important to do both. One is that um, you want to talk to them informally all the time, you know, and you get salespeople who say, oh, how's business, you know, and you know they're not going to listen to an answer. But you are, you want to know about their business. You want to know about their lives. 
you want to know what's going on with them because then you can understand their problems and then you can get to offering them something that's going to help them. So be at the networking dues, be in the same forums, Facebook groups, whatever, and soak it up, soak it up, soak it up. But the other thing as a practical tip you can do is to draw yourself up a survey uh, and ask some of your key customers to help to actually score you on all the different aspects of what you offer against your, say, three competitors. And so you ask them to score who's best on design, who's best on price, who's best on service, and you know, just for just the key things. Um, you know, maybe get to 10 questions with three or four competitors. And that you'll be surprised how much that draws out to because you think you know what your customers think about you, but the chances are you don't. And you know, then you, again you'll be able to see both where you're doing well and what differential is associated with you and what customers want, because I would suggest you do more of that. And also, um, and more of putting that across, that differential. And at the same time, just as a little bonus, you can see where they're not very happy with competition. And why not steal that at work as well? But that's, as I say, a secondary bonus. But most of all, it keys you into what they think about you. And you will never get that unless you ask. So true. It's true that someone who's not happy will mm. tell you. Yeah. But the people who are happy <laughs> don't 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 usually sometimes they do, but they may not share it <laughs> as readily as the people who aren't happy with you. Yes, one of the things that I teach in some of my courses, I've said it in the podcast, is that price really shouldn't ever be your differentiator because there's so many unknown variables that can go into that. If your costs increase, your price has to increase, and then that may no longer be your differentiator. So that is the last one that we recommend people focus on. And one of my small pet peeves, it's not really a pet peeve, but it's kind of old and tired, is I see a lot of people recommending you have your statement, you know, I help blank oh, with God. blank for blank reason. <laughs> oh, I hate that. It's my pet peeve too. Oh. <laughs> Good, I'm not alone. It is, first of all, not a differentiator. No. When you do that, you look like everybody else. And it's yeah. good to help you wrap your mind around it, but it shouldn't be the message that you're putting out to your prospects. You know, I help entrepreneurs focus their marketing so they make more money. Yes. But if I say that, I'm just like everyone else. And it's not about the different pieces that I offer. And some of those pieces are hard to relay fully. The whole piece about future strategy, mm. if an entrepreneur's not even realizing yet that they need to be thinking about the future strategy True. in their job, yeah. me telling them that we help set your marketing up for that future strategy, that's not their pain point yet. So even sometimes you have to figure out the differentiator at different points in your customer's journey, that blanket, fill in the blank statement. I, I, I absolutely love it, Vicky. I'm, I mean, to the point I actually did an article about it a year or so ago. <laughs> you know, I find it so phony too, you know, because with the best will in the world, this I help business, you know, I help a, you know, old lady across the road. You know, I don't help for a living. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I find yeah. it really wrong on every level. <laughs> Let's all stop using that fill in the blank phrase. Let's make please. it our campaign. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. On a marketing basis, it's absolutely pointless too. It, it helps you at the very beginning of your entrepreneurship journey to kind of focus in for yourself, but it mm. should not be your marketing message. No. One of the tips I like that you shared is needing to refocus on the why. Sometimes you need to refocus the why. Your current why may be different than your initial why, and that's part of yeah. the 
growth process that we've talked about. But one of the things I really like about social media, you know, digital, having a website is that a lot of that information we've shared at some point, and it's easy now to kind of scroll back Mm -hmm. and see what we had shared or go back and read. I have part of my why on my website, on my about page yeah, and just pull it up and kind of read. What was I thinking at that point? And it can help refocus you on that. And it may even be like, well, my why is a little different now. So how is it different? And then I'll go in and update that page a bit just to kind of keep that my own journey. I believe things like that help connect you, especially in a service-based business, yeah. help connect you to your customers. But it's so much easier to do that now. Even on Facebook, it'll pop up the memories. Oh, you shared sure. this yeah. 10 years ago yeah. and you go look and, oh, wow. Okay. It can help you keep connected to that, which is, you know, one of those benefits of technology that I think we kind of overlook True. sometimes. Yeah. No, there are benefits. Even for somebody who's non-digital age as me, there are benefits. Um, I was saying to you that, you know, the best way in this day and age, and, and some of this I was aware of before, and some of this I have to admit I got from one of the great contributors to a book, um, which is a man called David Mayer Scott, who is, is, is American. And he was explaining this concept more of fanocracy, which he's written about, and how important it is now to build a fan base. You know, his investigations took him to Harry Potter, among other things. And if you think about the Harry Potter fans now, you know, not only are they so devoted, so, you know, and have created myriad of industries, but they also make up their own stories about what Harry is like, what his future is. And, you know, they are completely and utterly involved. And that, that is your true fans. Now, that is ideally what you're aiming at. I know that's extreme, but that is ideally what you're it's aiming at. It's not extreme in our household. <laughs> Well, yeah, I I have five Harry Potter fans, and one of them oh wow could do every book I think verbatim. <laughs> oh well, there you are. You know all about Harry Potter fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, anybody listening with a Harry Potter fan in, in their household will know exactly what we're talking about. You know, it's living and breathing, and it's almost got nothing to do with the original books anymore. It's part of life, and that's what you're trying to create with your business and the people who you do business with part there's lots of ways of doing that but I know we, we're sort of fairly short on time now but one of the things is uh two two big practical tips I'll give you there one is authenticity because nobody is ever going to love you if you're fake with them and that means everything that means being honest that means being transparent and you know if you mess up say so all those things you know it's the only way to get fans and the other is to use video a lot um which i'm sure sure you talk tell people as well but you i mean you may well know this but i i I certainly didn't before and david explained to me that actually it's a motor neuron thing but we actually relay you, you you do know this, but I, as I say, I hadn't heard it before, but that call it actually causes us to relate to people when we're on video and make them think we're friends, which of course is, is the whole basis of the fan thing. It makes that connection for you in a way that people just don't, you know, from a piece of words or whatever, or an ad. So, uh, so video and authenticity would be my first two huge tips towards creating a fan base. Perfect tips. And it is true with video because right now I'm looking at you and yeah. I'm talking with you mm-hmm. and it, it goes beyond what we could do by email or text or even yeah. phone call where you can hear my voice. It gives that extra layer to it of relationship building. And there's a ton of other great reasons for video as well, but Mm. that is so true that video can help create that, that that fan group. Yes. And, and storytelling, since you brought up Harry Potter, there's 
place is for just having a snippet of like, oh, look, this client, you know, did something great because we helped them to fine telling the story about what was the beginning, what happened in the middle, what's the end. It's yeah. similar to what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. It's not just sharing. I could have easily asked you to email me, you know, Five the top 27 tips, tips <laughs> that you've shared here. You know, I could have just said, oh, email those over and I'll just post them on my website. But it's not the same as getting to no. talk to you. I, I form friendships with all of my podcast yeah. guests. It's great. So definitely a great tip and something to be aware of there. So now we're to the point before we share your contact info where people can connect with you that I'm going to let you pick my brain and see if you have a question for me. Well, obviously, you know, from my point of view, I've had to shift from old school to <laughs> new school and, you know, from selling B2B to B2C. So, you know, my marketing world has gone upside down to put it mildly. And, uh, you know, moving into selling books is, is a whole new thing for me. And some, some of my mind that was taken care of was super by having a drug publisher. But, you know, obviously equally, I want to do what I can to support that. So for authors, what do you find the best tip now for promoting business books? The good news is that at the very basic foundation, there's not a lot of difference between B2B and B2C marketing, because in the end, you're still marketing to individuals, even if they're part of a business. They're the person that you're trying to build the relationship with. You can't build a relationship with an entity. It's a person. Yeah. So usually it's people that are trying to flip the other direction. They're doing B2C, business to consumer, in case anyone doesn't know. And they're trying to move into the B2B world and they think it's this big, huge, different thing. And there are pieces of it that are different, but at the core, it's still a person that a you're connecting with. Mm -hmm. And the other good point, although I'm going to share a few specific tips with you, is that marketing a book isn't a lot different than marketing anything else. At the core, marketing is marketing. So you already know a lot of that and you're going to have a, a, a good time with it. But I do have a few specific tips for authors and especially first time authors that maybe haven't done this before. I've worked with some first time authors and these are some of the pieces that we did. So first, remember that there are three main types of marketing, especially if you're talking more digital. There is organic, where you're sharing messages on your social media, on your website, people are becoming visitors, and then they're becoming fans, and all of that is growing just because of the interactions that you're having. One is paid, where you're doing things like pay-per-click advertising, boosting a post on your Facebook page, which I never recommend to boost. I always recommend go through the ad system, but... A lot of people are more familiar with that term. Doing Google ads, you can do LinkedIn ads, paid sponsorships are a piece of that. So anytime you're spending money that you would consider advertising, it falls under the paid. The third one, which is where a lot of entrepreneurs and first-time authors, even well-known authors, kind of miss or maybe don't even realize it's a thing is earned. Earned media is when other people are sharing your message. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot to do with fans. 50 million people are out there sharing about Harry Potter now. But it can also be something as simple as someone read your book and liked it and they shared it on their own social media or wrote a review about it. Or you're asking people to do things to interact with you. You know, maybe you requested the review. You said, hey, you know, you're my best friend and you read the book because you like me, but you also said it was good. So can you share a review? Even if you ask them, it's still earned because it's other people doing it. A news media outlet, a newspaper, radio, television, whatever it may be, online, a YouTube channel, them talking about you is also earned. So anytime that other people are helping you promote your product, your service, your book, your message, mm -hmm. and you're not 
paying them to do so, it's earned media. So that's a great place to start building. That's your fans. Yeah. Your raving yeah. fans, your your Potter Pottermore, your Harry Potter <laughs> universe. That's the earned media. And so most people understand enough about organic and paid media. You know, you know you can post on do a blog post on your website. You know you can post things on social media. You know you can use pay-per-click advertising, even if you're not really comfortable doing it, you haven't done it before. You know, the system kind of walks you through it. But the earned media is where mm a good focus can be. Another thing that is kind of related to the earned media is book tours. Now, traditionally, those were where you go around and you're presenting your book at bookstores and you're getting on television if, you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're popular enough, but, you know, New York Times bestseller, you're probably going to appear on the Today Show. But now there are online book tours that kind of do a very similar thing with bloggers related to your topic there are some people who do kind of book tours as their main service like they are they do constant book reviews and that's why people are coming to their website is because they have all these book reviews so an online book tour can be a great way to get some of that earned media most of those people won't you know you can't just pay me to put your book on my site like if I don't like your book I'm not going to recommend it there's no payment piece involved in a lot of those, some of them there is. It's still an online book tour, especially during COVID, worldwide pandemic. It's a great way to get interest out there. Another piece to consider, not just about your book, but your personal brand, especially for a first time author. They may have had a personal brand for their entrepreneurship venture. You had branding for your former company. Even if you're a service provider, having branding for myself in performing a service, that's still going to be a little bit different than the personal brand I would want to do for my book, for being an author. So you may need to sit down and think and be a little bit strategic with that. And then in all of these things that you're doing, that piece should play a part in it. Obviously, having engaging content on your website, on your social media, not just talking to, but using some of that storytelling ability to get people engaging with you. Because again, that's part of the creating fans is how can you build that relationship? Video and not just having a video, but how can it kind of engage your audience and kind of deepen that relationship? I had mentioned asking for reviews. You can provide free copies of books to some people who might review it for you. If you've printed but haven't actually started selling the book yet, it can kind of be a perk to your audience to give them a free advance copy if they're willing to do a review for you. And getting reviews on sites like Amazon, obviously one of the biggest booksellers, Goodreads, we had mentioned bloggers in your industry, getting reviews from those people, because like anything else, when someone's going online to make a purchase, say if I go to Amazon to purchase your book, hopefully there'll be some reviews there that tell me it's worth my time reading it, you know, not not to mention the payment I make, but that I'm going to get some good information. So having a strategy to get those reviews and get started with an initial block of reviews. A lot of the authors I've worked with make that plan before the book's ever printed. I never recommend inauthenticity as part of that because it's visible to mm-hmm. someone. Do it. So it's not like, oh, you're my sister. You have to review the book and you're not even in the industry. It doesn't matter. You have to review it. You want real reviews, but you can start lining those up ahead of time. You contact someone, can I send you an advanced copy of the book for you to do a review? Get that plan in place. If you haven't done that piece yet, you can start now and do it wherever you are in your book career. Make a plan to actively ask people. Sometimes they'll read the book, they'll love the book. They don't think to do a review, but if you ask them, they will. 
And then to expand and you want to sell the book. Most authors also want some entrepreneurship piece of that, that can take it further, that can take someone from buying the book to additional income stream for you. With some people, they're writing a book related directly to a product or service they still have. And that's kind of a natural fit for people who are wondering how to make that happen. You want to build your email list because you don't want just a book that someone read and you don't have any way to connect with them in the future. So you need an active plan on ways you can get their contact information so that you can stay in touch with them and build those fans. And I don't mean just having them on your social media page. That is never my number one recommendation. Find ways from those places to gather their contact information in something you own so that you can stay in touch with them. Layer upon that, something like merchandise offers. Is there merchandise that makes sense that would coordinate with the theme of the book? Get back to Harry Potter again, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sell Harry Potter figurines. Almost every book topic has something that can be related. Now that may mm. be something from you personally, such as maybe a, a course. Maybe they can purchase this five-part course and learn something related to the book topic. Or maybe it's, you know, maybe somebody's doing a, a, a work of fiction and it's a romance, but maybe there's something you can tie into that. Things that you can find on Amazon and recommend through their affiliate program. Or maybe it's simple t-shirt, Harry Potter fan club, whatever it may be. <laughs> But you want to think strategically <laughs> how that can happen. Ideally, you've gone through some of that process like before you even started writing so that you can build into what you're writing things that trigger people to understand that there's more and to come back. But if not, or if it doesn't work, if it doesn't flow well in the writing itself, or you haven't thought of that yet, you can still start now and start thinking of those ways that you can have additional streams of income. Hopefully some of them are passive where you're not having to be active with all of it, but active ones can work as well. And how you can make that happen. Again, it's about starting with the base and building those layers on when they make sense, when the time's right, so that you can expand, you can grow and scale. <laughs> you can scale your author business. For a lot of authors, it also means writing another book. Yeah. So you can have that plan as well. If we're here, what can I start doing now with these people who I've collected their contact information? They're on my email list. How can I use my interactions with them to start planning my next book and what's going to be in that? For the most part, a lot of those strategies are the same as if you're marketing anything. So hopefully I've sparked a couple of ideas there for you and for some other first time authors that may be visiting us. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of them I've, I've come across, but only through my research, I think it's the first time also you just are clueless about how on earth to go about it often. So, you know, and I thought that was an amazing summary, Vicky. It, you go Google and you get <laughs> 38 million responses. Yeah. No, yeah. it's too much. I just Absolutely. want a couple tips and, and how they work together. So Definitely. Well, before we wrap up, I'd like you to share how our audience can connect with you and get in touch with you. I would love to hear from anybody in your audience with any questions at all. And if you want to know not any more about the book too, obviously, but if there's anything you want to ask me, the answer is the same. And that I'm on jancavell.co.uk for the website and you'll get my email address so you can pop an email straight to me and you will get to me on there uh, from there so jancavell.co.uk if you want to leap on there now you will get straight through we'll also share the link in the description smashing thank you people watching or listening so they'll be able to grab that Lovely. link thank and you. connect more with you sounds good well, Jan, thank you for being here today. You shared so much great information that I bet the audience has been taking notes. If they haven't taken notes, they can go back and replay <laughs> and, and take notes the second time around. I really appreciated talking to you and learning so much about what you've done. It's been really great having you here. It's been great meeting and making friends with you, Vicky. It's been really lovely. For our audience, if you have any marketing questions, you can visit our website, vickywoo.marketing. 
bottom right corner, there's a chat bubble icon and you can ask your question there and we'll either answer you directly or we may even talk about your question on an upcoming episode. While you're here, check out our other videos and subscribe to our channel so that you never miss the latest marketing tips.